Well, hi everyone and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy. This is part two of my look at sleepy gravity. Now in part one, we listened to Sleeping Warrior's presentation on Newton's laws of motion, specifically the first and the second law of motion. In the first law of motion, he raised exception to the term unbalanced force, and we went through that rather thoroughly. In the second law of motion, he said that there could be no acceleration due to gravity, because gravity is not a force. Therefore, we don't have the F in the F equals MA. Now, if that was ridiculous enough, wait until you hear the panel discussion afterwards. So let's cue up the music and then come back to Nathan Oakley and his panel. Now recall, we're not really looking at Nathan Oakley and Sleeping Warrior and their misunderstanding of science. We're looking at the techniques that they use as science deniers. So, let's go ahead and have a listen. Was that a picture of that guy, um, Fight the Flat Earth? Who cares? Any comments on the presentation? Yeah, in terms of... I remember doing this um, in A-level physics. How do you get it? And getting it is a game, um, a trick. I'll put simply, you, you, you take real term stuff and you, you take a, a ball bearing and you drop it. And this is where they get the numbers uh, for the A. If I could just screen share for a. Now, just before you do, Adam, do numbers satisfy Newton's first definition, yeah. for Newton's first law of motion? No, in it. No, and it gets better as well. Uh, so just, it is exactly numbers, if you can see here. What they're going to do is take these things and then use the formula uh, equation for a line of y equals mx plus c uh, to define that the gradient will be equal to the force of gravity. Um, and the way they do that is by taking stuff and dropping it. Had he actually paid attention in his A-level class, he would have understood what this experiment is about. First of all, we have certain equations in physics that describe motion. And generally, if we have, say, three variables, force equals mass times acceleration, we can define each of those variables in terms of the other two. So if we know two of the variables, we can calculate the third. Now, likewise, we can also define the relationship between distance, acceleration, and time. Now, in this case, distance is the height of the two. And here is the formula where we relate those variables to each other. The height equals one-half times the acceleration times the time squared. Height is in meters. Acceleration is in meters per second squared, and time is in seconds. Now you'll notice that in this particular equation, one half is a constant. Now, rearranging this algebraically, we get something that looks like this. Now again, what this equation does is it relates three variables to each other. The height, which is the distance, the acceleration in meters per second squared, and the time in seconds. If we can determine any two of those, we can calculate the third one. And that's what this experiment is designed to do. So let's continue to listen. Um, now, I would suggest to you that what you're measuring there is the force that you've had to put in to the system. Now, I don't know if you remember this, but this is P Brain's rock. And what he is suggesting is that by me raising this rock up, this rock somehow stores a memory of where it started, and it stores the energy that I put into it by lifting it up. And in a way, that's true, because that's called potential energy. Potential energy is defined as the height times the acceleration of gravity. So if I increase the height, 
I have more potential energy. However, if this rock is sitting on a shelf and falls off, how does it remember that without taking into account gravity? It doesn't. This is a rock. So how does this rock remember where it came from? It's a rock. It's as unaware of its surroundings as pea brain is. And then you're measuring it equilibrate. There is no uh, overreaching force. You're just measuring the displacement you put into the system by picking up the ball bearing and dropping it. That's what you're demonstrating there. You're not demonstrating a force that you can't demonstrate. Um, but what I want to do, just to give Nathan a giggle, is go to the top. This is A-level physics that is from. And I shall just read it. The overall aim of the experiment is to calculate the value of the acceleration due to gravity g. This is done by measuring the time it takes for a ball bearing to fall a certain distance. The acceleration is then calculated as I briefly outlined. Variables. Independent variable is height, and the dependent variable is time. And that, of course, is correct. Here's our equation. Now, we can vary the height, and if we vary the height, in order to make it still equal one half of the acceleration times time square, the time has to change. So by varying the height and measuring the resultant time that it takes, we get two of our three variables. We can calculate the acceleration simply by rearranging it. Here you go. All there is to it. So indeed, since we are changing the height, it is the independent variable. By changing the height, there is a resultant change in the amount of time it takes the ball bearing to fall. That's the dependent variable. It's a classic scientific experiment. See how Nathan screws it up. Your controls are the steel boring, the same electromagnet, and the distances. And I'll leave it at that, because I think sorry, no more. Well, sorry, from what I understand, the proposed hypothesis is if height, then time. Is that correct? Well, sort of, Nathan. Because changing the height or the distance the ball bearing has to fall will result in a change in the time it takes to fall that distance. And then we use those two variables to determine the acceleration acting on the ball bearing. That seems to be what comes out of an A-level physics syllabus, yeah. If height, then time is the claimed experimental alternative hypothesis. My God, what's the world come to, Adam? Now, Nathan, that seems very clear to me and most A-level physics students, except possibly Adam. What is your problem with it? You can mock it if you wish, but you have to actually follow through and tell us why it's wrong. I'll wait. And I heard Conspiracy Cats recently attack uh, Spurs Chemo, and he said, you have no idea what they're teaching kids. And that's a valid point. We're not kids. We're not in school anymore. So what do they teach kids? And if this is an example of what they're teaching kids, that the independent variable can be height, what is height? It's an arbitrary measuring scale that we ascribe to the distance between objects. All right, Sleepy, what exactly is your problem with that? Yes, it's an arbitrary scale. It's meters. Can you not get a relative relationship between one meter and two meters? Can we not figure out the relationship between meters and kilometers? Perhaps you might want to ask Nathan to help you with that one. But your objection that it's an arbitrary unit of measurement is dismissed as irrelevant. What is height? It's an arbitrary measuring scale that we ascribe to the distance between objects in a vertical axis, right? But it's a, it's a concept. <laughs> That's a not, it's not a valid independent variable. And, and why not? Why is it not a valid independent variable? Can we not vary the height that we drop something from? Can I not drop it from one meter or two meters? Can I not measure the time? Come on, Sleepy. Wake up. Well, I know they're warning kids about um, flat earthers. That I know for a fact. Actually, I would be quite surprised if they wasted classroom time on something as silly as the flat earth. I don't think it comes up at all. Sorry. And if it does, it's probably just to warn them and give them an example of pseudoscience that they may encounter someday. Just to round that out, Adam, um, to correct me if I'm wrong, no medium was mentioned. 
I, I, absolutely no. no. Um, well, that was another that was another spin-off that I wanted to just add. Newton's first law of motion states that an egg will remain in the middle of its medium unless acted upon by a force, right? It doesn't mention the medium. But if you have the interaction of one relative egg relative to its medium and you vary the medium or the egg or the density of what I what or the you know the mass or the volume of either, then an acceleration occurs. And if you isolate the perception or the perspective to just the egg, then you will say, well, there must be a force there. And we can say, well, there is a force, it's pressure. Pressure is caused by the interactions of the molecules against the, the walls of its container. And we put more molecules in that medium and we increase the rate of collisions between the egg, uh, the, the medium and the surface, and that pushed the egg up and all of the mass went below the egg. Now we can satisfy that definition, right? But conversely, if you, if you say, um, if, if if you don't limit it to just the egg and you take into account all of the re- all the relative circumstances and include the medium, you don't even have to. You, you, there's a problem with Newton's first law of motion there because it says that an object in motion, an object at rest, will remain at rest unless acted upon by a force. Well, we varied the density of the medium and it caused an acceleration. And as them lot would say, well, where's the force in that? Well, even though we can say it's pressure, and that's a valid scientific explanation, because Newton's first law doesn't reference mediums, you're working outside of that that first law of motion, yet you're still achieving the same result. Oh, dear God, Anthony, come on. You're still on the egg thing? I mean, that is a seventh grade science test to demonstrate Archimedes' law on buoyancy. Gravity is integral to that. That is the external force. You trying to rename gravity as relative density differential does not change the fact that it is a downward acceleration of 9.81 meters per second squared at sea level. It just doesn't. You don't get to just rename known forces in the universe. Gravity's gravity. Now, I've already been over your egg experiment. I'm not going to waste any more time with it. You know, come on, get past it, Anthony. You were debunked. So the question really is, is Newton's first law of motion wide and broad enough to account for all of the variables when there are other variables that cause acceleration that he doesn't really consider or account for? And it's a bit epistemological, but it's still a valid question to ask. Anybody from Discord got any comment on what Anthony's presented? Feel free. Any science deniers want to challenge the science that was presented? Wasn't any science presented? Well, any science non-science deniers want to question any of the non-science that was presented? All righty then. Well, the, the, the little bit I did watch, I noticed the other question that he really shied away from was what causes the rotation of the Earth, right? Because he has to answer the same question. You know, where, where's the force? Struggle to. You know, what is causing the rotation of the Earth? What causes it? It's all density dependent, isn't it? When you... I'm sorry, folks. Uh, that that just was a bit much. Hang on, just a second. There, I'm I, I'm better now. All right. So, after confusing himself thoroughly on Newton's laws of motion, now we get something out of left field. What caused the Earth to begin to rotate? You know, the fact that the Earth is rotating does not mandate we know what started it rotating. We simply measure it as a rotating Earth. So I'm not even going to bother going into that. Maybe another time. What is causing the rotation of the Earth? What causes it? It's all density dependent, isn't it? When you combine two liquids and one is lighter than the other, uh, because they don't mix, there is no, no vector down. Actually, the liquid is going up. Hold on a second. I don't like that question. There is a, there is a vector to up and down. Hold on, hold we on. demonstrated that if we... So one of the things that uh, Flat Earth claimed was that relative density disequilibrium doesn't account for or explain the directionality, but it does. Because this is where... See, I'm reluctant to even have this conversation with I am people too. on their side. Sorry, why are you explaining this? Do you, have, do you have a claim in this regard, Anthony? Oh, I just can address, I can rebut the assertion that uh, uh, relative density doesn't have ref- a directionality no, no. to it. No, no, no. You've already done that. Refutation of a claim of gravity has been achieved, right? Further to that, you can 
if you choose to, offer up a claim now. But why would you do that? Okay, I think that this is very telling. Now, I've always maintained that Nathan is a relatively bright guy and knows that the Earth is a globe just as much as I do. He's a trained actor playing a role. Now, he realizes that Anthony is well over his head right now and is about to say something stupid. So he is trying to put the brakes on that to stop Anthony from destroying his entire argument again by saying something so mind-numbingly dumb that people will realize that he's not somebody that we should be listening to, if they haven't already. Just to rebut the, the nonsense, the You've lie that Fight the Fight has said. That. You're falling into the trap of feeling that you, somehow your responsibility to offer up an alternative explanation. Now, don't get me wrong, I appreciate what you, over the last two years, maybe even longer, starting with you and Arwin just discussing the relative density disequilibrium argument in juxtaposition with the gravity argument. That was fascinating. However, much as I appreciate it, and I'm the first to say we're in a world of discovery and we can find out new things, and this is one of them. In this specific respect, when it's somebody making a claim about gravity, rip it to shreds and just leave it at that. You know, in 20 minutes, if you would like to just bring up relative density and just start describing it, I'd be like, yeah, cool, man, let's discuss this, it's great. But in this regard, it leaves the impression that somehow you've got to offer an alternative and you don't. Well, actually, you do, Nathan, because if you say gravity's wrong, you have to tell us what you've come up with that will not only explain what gravity already explains, but explain it as well, if not better. Otherwise, it reverts to just nah -uh. and nah -uh doesn't generate papers, my friend. Make that clear. You feel free to if you want to. Yeah, I want to rebut the assertion that Fight the Flat Earth claims wrongly that relative density doesn't account for or explain the directionality. Ah. His question was what? Sucker. Go ahead. Well, folks, there you have it. The Earth is still a sphere, and it's still rotating. This is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Northern Michigan. Thank you very much for all my channel members, my Patreons, and those that support me with PayPal. We're building some really nice things for this channel in 2022. And I'm glad you're along for the ride. Take care, guys. Bye.